Hello viewers, welcome to my channel Pharmacypedia. This is Dr. Shikha Chauhan and in this session we are going to further learn about the SUPAC guidelines. SUPAC stands for Scale Up and Post Approval Changes. The topic has been taken from the unit 1 of the subject Industrial Pharmacy 2 B Farm 7th semester. If you are visiting my channel for the first time, please do like, share and subscribe to my channel Pharmacypedia for getting further updates. So first, let us try to understand about the SUPAC. SUPAC stands for the Scale Up and Post Approval Changes. So once your product has been in the market and any manufacturer or the company wants to make some changes due to any number of the reasons, then they will be applied under the SUPAC category, Scale Up and Post Approval Changes. So once the technology transfer for a pharmaceutical product from the research to the production floor with simultaneously increase in the production output is commonly called as scale up process. So in scale up simply in simple terms it means the process of increasing the batch size and conversely the scale down refers to the decrease in the batch size. So the scale up process and the changes made after the approval in the composition, manufacturing process or in the manufacturing equipment or change of the site have become known as the scale up and post approval changes. So a series of documents were introduced by the US FDA under the CDER to help the applicants who wishes for the post approval changes. So once the product has been marketed and the company wanted to make some changes in terms of the formulation, in terms of the site change, in terms of the bath size or in terms of the preservatives or any of the excipients, they have to apply under this SUPAC guidelines to the regulatory agencies, to the FDA. And they have been in conformity with the USP. So like uh, ARPS. American Association of Pharmacists in consultation with the US FDA decided to put up put forth the guidelines under the name of the SUPAC guidelines in the year 1991. So they had a conference in the workshop it was decided to proceed with the guidelines and these guidelines were termed as the SUPAC guidelines. So since they were since they were form, formed with the objective of helping to the sponsors who wishes to do the scale up and post approval changes. So like these changes were then categorized into four categories of different products. So under the uh, con, under the finalized SUPAC guidelines this came in into different uh, formats. The first was the SUPAC IR. IR stands for the immediate release. Immediate means the product is releasing immediately the drugs. Then SUPAC IR question and answers which were further released. Then PAC ATLS. Then SUPAC MR. MR stands for the modified release. These guidelines were released in the September and approved in 1997. Then SUPAC SS. SS stands for semi-solids. So it is, it is for the non-sterile semi-solid dosage form. These guidelines were in place in May 1997. So SUPAC guidelines, scale up and post -appro approval changes guidelines came into place by the these agencies for only to those sponsors who wishes to make any sort of the changes once the all the process has been done. So like the scale up process and these changes have to be implemented. The changes are being made in the manufacturing process or the chemistry of a drug product following approval and continue throughout the life. So once it has been approved, even then the manufacturer wishes to make some sort of the changes into the formulation, into the equipment, into the bath size or he wishes to change the site of manufacturing, then he had to go to the regulatory agencies under these super guidelines format. So like uh, before uh, proceeding for these sorts of the changes, the manufacturer has to identify what level of the changes is being desired. So the, all the levels or the likelihood of the impacts on the formulation has to be worked around. So the overall objective of these guidelines was to have a good quality product and good performing product. So all the changes can be classified into three categories. The first is the level one changes, second level two changes and level three changes. So as we proceed ahead in the level, so the complexity increases. For example, level 1 changes are, are, are those changes basically which does not or unlikely to have detectable impact. So which does not have an overall impact on, on the quality as well as performance of your product. Whereas level 2 changes are those changes which are likely to have a significant impact, which are likely to have. That is not sure whether they are going to have it or not, but they can have an impact on the, on the 
quality and performance of the product then level 3 changes these changes are those changes which surely have, are going to have a significant impact on the changes so from the manufacturer whenever they proposes for any chart any sort of the changes whether it is the change in the formulation or it is the change in the manufacturing equipment or it is the change in the site or uh, in the batch size or the preservative they need to understand and grade the change whether the changes lying into level 1 changes level 2 changes and level 3 changes level 1 unlikely impact level 2 significant impact likely to have significant impact and level 3 could have significant impact so once they have graded down the level then they need to understand what sort of the changes are being desired and at what levels for example when we talk in terms of the level of changes three changes are there minor changes level one uh, moderate changes level two and major changes in level three so accordingly the filings the corrections have to be made in the subsequent documents so three sorts of the filings are being done to have these uh, changes rectification the first is the annual reports second is the changes of being affected by the supplements and third is the prior approval supplements next they move on ahead to the test different sorts of the test which were required to be conducted to ensure the level of changes and their impacts for example a changes uh, changes and test carried out as per the compendial test compendial means pharmacopoeial test or in vitro dissolution test or in vivo test in vitro dissolution can sometimes need to be taken out for example if there is a formulation change change in the excipient or change in the preservative or change in the batch size or any of the changes which can ultimately impact the disintegration or the dissolution or the amount of the drug being absorbed will have to be conducted so if the bioavailability changes accordingly you have to proceed for the in vivo test only in vivo means inside the body so if required for proving the bioequivalence of the product, you need to carry out the in vivo test. So, my dear students, though uh, through the SUPAC guidelines, it was very clear cut and easy to understand that the, all the changes desired by the manufacturer uh, have to be categorized into four categories. First is the your if there is a change in the formulation, change in the excipients change in the site of the manufacturing, for example, different locations, change in the skilled manpower, change in the batch size of the formulation or change in the preservatives so once you have identified the change you need to see how it is going to impact your formulation how it is going to affect the quality and performance of your product so accordingly you need to decide the level of the change whether it is lying into the minor change category level one level two moderate changes or level three major changes so once you have identified them then you have to see how these corrections have to be done the manufacturer ha has to file the and in terms of the annual reports or the changes being affected is additional supplement has to be provided to the regulatory agencies or like uh, you need to have the prior approval for the supplement as well so accordingly for doing and judging and justifying the change you need to perform the pharmacopoeial test or you need to perform the in vitro dissolution test to check for the bioavailability or you need to perform the in vivo test for uh, checking the bioequivalence. So the CUPAC guidelines basically lies into four changes. They are reviewing uh, once your product is into the market for the post approval changes, they are being categorized into four, four changes. First is your formulation or excipients change or like site of manufacturing, the scale of manufacturing, batch size change and the manufacturing process or equipment. For example, the starting time is increased or like there is an increase in the preservative content or like any of the changes. So uh, these we have discussed, for example, level of one changes will include change in the form, uh, color, flavor or change in the excipients. So uh, what is desired that this color change will not ultimately impact the bioavailability and bioequivalence. So this will be categorized into level one change. Level two changes are those changes which can have an impact on your product. For example, change in the excipient such as your disintegrating agent or the amount of the binding agent. This is going to affect the bioavailability of the formulation. So they will be categorized into level two change and for, the, for that you need to perform the in vitro dissolution testing again. 
third change is level 3 which are the significant changes for example any sort of the quality or the quantity change of the excipients from the level 1 and level 2 will fall into the level 3 the reason being uh, once your bioavailability has been impacted you have to prove the bioequivalence and for that you need to carry out the in vivo studies so they are for sure going to have a huge impact on the quality and the performance of the product so in terms of the SUPAC guidelines, three guidelines have been issued. First is for the immediate release dosage form. Second is for the modified release dosage form. And third is for about semi-solids. So semi-solids like changes in the preservatives. So when we talk about the immediate release dosage form, the focus has been to the changes in the amount of the excipients which is used in the drug product and the focus should not be on the change in the amount of the drug substance. So any change in the drug excipient will rise into the immediate release dosage forms. Then again, there are different levels to deal with it. Level 1, Level 2, Level 3, Level 4. So like for different, uh, sorry, three levels are there. Level 1, Level 2, Level 3. So when, when we talk about the Level 1, it includes like change in the color or change in the concentration of the excipients. For this, you need to have the excipients ranges analysis and you need to have the document correction. For example, you need to carry out the stability testing and all these testing reports have to be compiled in the annual reports which are being submitted to the regulatory agencies for approval. Level 2 will require change in the technical grade of the excipients. For example, previously you were using the IP grade. Now you want to use the USP grade since IP grade is not available. So in that case, this level of change will line to the level 2 category. And for that, you need to present annual report as well as you need to get the prior approval for the supplement from the regulatory agency. Then level three changes, level three changes are those changes of which are having like going to impact on the bioavailability of your product. So they are, are the above that changes and for that again you have to take the prior approval from the agencies. You need to conduct the stability test, you need to have the multi point dissolution studies, you need to compile the data in the form of annual reports to the FDA. Next, we move on to the modified release. As the term indicates, modified release for the components and the composition of non-releasing control excipients and release controlling excipients. So, so they basically focus on changes to the non-release controlling excipients. Again, they are being classified into three categories, level one, level two, level three. So level one includes if the change in the concentration is less than 5%. In, in that case, you need to check the stability again. You need to check and go ahead for the pharmacopoeia test and you have to present all the changes in the results in the form of the annual report to the FDA as per the guideline. Level 2 changes if the change is less than 10%. So if it was less than 5%, it will come into level 1. If it is less than 10%, it will come into the category of level 2. Again, you have to have the multi-point resolution studies to prove the bioavailability again, that it is not going to affect the bioavailability of the product. You need to have the stability data and you need to take prior permission from the FDA for filling into the supplements and annual report has to be proposed. Now, SUPAC SS. SS stands for semi-solids for the like uh, non-sterile dosage forms, for example, creams, ointments, gels, and lotions. So they are being further classified into level 1, level 2, level 3. Level 2, level 1 basically involves in the change in the suppliers or like there is a partial removal of any ingredient or like if the overall change is less than 5%. So again, you have to perform the testing as per the pharmacopoeia. You, ne you need to go ahead for the stability testing and overall results have to be uh, represented in the form of the annual report to the Fed, FDA or other regulatory agencies. Level 2, if the change is less than 10% and there is any sort of the particle size distribution change or like the technical grade of the excipient. Grade means like you are changing from USP to BP or BP to IP. In that case, you need to again check go for the multi-point resolution studies you have to perform the in vitro data to show that your product is having the same bioavailability and it is not going to impact the bioavailability of the product and again you have to perform the stability testing of the product all the reports have to be compiled and sent in the form of the annual reports 
So it's like site changes. This again is very important. When you take the approval, it is as per for, for a specific site. For example, if you have taken from any one single location, you need, you're, you're applying for the product, you get the approval for the product that is for that location only. But once you change the site, you need to, ahead, as per the SUPAC guidelines, you have to apply for the post approval changes. You need to take prior permissions from the regulatory agencies. So it includes the site changes, manufacturing facilities changes, even it is applied to the contract manufacturers and it does not allow for the batch size change. Then for the batch size change, you have to understand the changes in the size of the batch from the pilot scale to the bio batch material or to the larger production batches. So the, as such, no such change in the SOP or the formulation and manufacturing procedure equipment is allowed. So when you change the batch size, it does it simply means you are increasing the batch size, you are doing the scale up, but no sort of other changes in the form of the formulation components or like manufacturing process or the change in the equipment is being permitted. So the batch size changes have to be taken prior permission from the regulatory agencies. The guideline also is uh, has certain limitations uh, such that these guidelines are not being revised. Moreover, they require the multiple changes. Uh, they does not allow for the multiple changes at the same time. For example, if you, have if you have applied for the change in the formulation, you cannot go for the side change. So they have to be in a sequence and it does not cover about the modified equipments. It is covering only the USB apparatus. If there is any modified sort of the equipment being available for the uh, dissolution studies, uh, this guideline is not covering that part. Moreover, it is um, it must be used in conjunction with other references, for example, experience handbook. So these are the certain limitations associated by, by for, for the SUPAC. But overall, if my dear students, if you consider the SUPAC guidelines, they allow the manufacturers to apply for the changes even after the post approval in the form of the formulation change or in the form of the location or in the form of the excipients or like modified release product. But these changes have to prove that your product is stable. It is it is having the same bioavailability. There is no change in the bioequivalence. Then, and these changes are not that much significant effect. So they may be allowed. If these... Uh, level of changes are high and they prove that they are it is impacting the overall uh, quality for, and the performance of the product these changes are not acceptable to the regulatory agencies so in that case you need you need to take permission from the regulatory agencies proving that your product is having the same viability and it is not going to impact the working of your product Thank you so much for watching my video. Please do like, share and subscribe to my channel Pharmacypedia for getting further updates.